Okay, uh, so uh, our next speaker is Janar. Uh, he's a senior AI project manager at uh, uh, Ericsson AI Research, where he mm -hmm. works mostly with customer facing um, projects, I understand. Yeah. And he's going to speak about uh, detecting wireless jammers and hackers uh, with the Jade framework. Uh, so that's going to be interesting to see how he fights the black hats. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, give a warm welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, uh, first I would like to say thank you for great organization and uh, being on stage for this opportunity. It's an amazing day, very interesting presentations. And hopefully you will like this topic as well. And uh, by the way, we have an AI community here. If you are interested with data science and AI, you can be part of our community. It's mainly about first socializing, second, by bringing great people together, we want to create some innovation ideas. So you are welcome. And uh, before, before I start, I would like to ask this question. Does anybody in this room still refuse using uh, smartphones? Really? <laughs> but uh, still you have a phone, right? You have a phone. Yeah, cell phone. Okay. That's good enough. <laughs> then I want to ask another question. Uh, almost everybody has smartphones. And then I want to ask another question. Is there anyone in your network between 15 to 70 refuse to use a cell phone? Yeah, okay, quite few. So I know many people, they don't have Spotify subscription today. I know many people, maybe they don't have a car or a bike, but almost everyone has at least one mobile device today. So can you imagine the challenge? How you can run this much subscribers on mobile networks? So mobile networks is one of the world's most complicated system. It's a dynamic environment, indoor, outdoor, nested. There's a high uncertainty due to the mobility you, they, no one didn't know from network, let's say mobile operator today, if you are using Telia, they didn't know that you were coming here. But they had to be prepared for this event, for this bunch of people. And imagine a big stadium event. So, on the other hand, there are so many different types of devices and applications. There are different radio technologies. Every, ten, every decade, we introduce a new generation of radio technology. Now we are already start talking about 6G. And each new technology comes with legacy. <laughs> it has to deal with the previous technologies. Like today, 5G has to deal with 4G. Tomorrow, 6G has to deal with existing technologies which are already deployed. So imagine the complexity and heterogeneity, and it's a worldwide deployed system. I want to give you just a few numbers. If you look at the mobile subscribers today, in the world we have 8.3 billion people using mobile technology. Maybe some of them are using still 1G in Africa, maybe, but uh, already we have many 5G users, and it's expected to be 10 times more in the next five years. It's about 4.4 billion. And another interesting number I would like to give you from India. In the last five years, the volume of the traffic is increased 15 times. 
Is there any other thing like this? Maybe Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies? I don't know. But it sounds like an excellent opportunity to invest. I don't know. It's not the topic of today, but... So, if you look at the populations in each country, we can get an in interpretation about the challenge that operators are facing. In US today, we have about 332 million people, and India, China, it's 1.4 billion. How a Telia company, Telia of China, can deal with this much people every day? They are moving around, going inside, outside. How can you ensure, plan your network capacity? How you can make sure that you are delivering good for your customers? So it's an amazing challenge, I think. But the solution is already given. The data-driven or AI-empowered network products. We cannot dedicate one guy for each base station or for each cell or for each subscribers. Imagine that someone is following you all the time just to make sure that you have a good coverage. <laughs> but we can deploy uh, data-driven AI systems. But still, as I said, huge system, huge complexity, so many different legacy limitations coming, still a challenge. Let's say we have machine learning, deep learning today, but still, still, still a big challenge because, yeah, it's, this technology is actually a kind of spotty, discrete. They are not really integrated. They didn't think about 5G when we were building this uh, 2G, 3G. So they are not really communicating at the back end. Nevertheless, the mobile operators are investing heavily to meet customer expectations and business requirements. And these guys coming up with $20 device that you can buy on eBay, they can mess up your multi-million dollar network operations. Mostly they are around 15 years old, just to, just to play. And uh, these gemmers are very different types of gemmers we can find on the market today. You can just plug in on your MacBook computer and just uh, they are targeting different, uh, different systems in the network, different frequencies we have. And uh, they have different type of behaviors. Some of them are continuous, some of them are discontinuous. And uh, these devices, depending on the distance, might be really painful. Degrades the network quality. And most of the time, this is experienced as network outage by the mobile subscribers. So this is how it looks like a base station. You have, let's say, if this is something in the downtown, you have a number of cells on different frequencies. And uh, if you have a jammer activated, you may target one of these cells, or you can target another frequency. Sometimes you affect one, you don't affect the other one on the same tower. And you can have a discontinuous behavior affecting multiple of them on different levels with impact. And uh, as I said, distance really matters here. Square distance of the square of the distance show you the impact that you that a jammer can make. And uh, when the, this is a quite dynamic system, imagine people are roaming around passing by cars, garbage truck is coming, and uh, these uplink frequencies, when you change a frequency, when you change a location of the tower, all sample distributions are changing. And uh, we try to log data about the performance of this uh, deployment on the base station at the back end, aggregated KPIs, we, have, we call them cell KPIs. And here uh, an example. You can see when we compare a cell with the jammer activated cell, 
Here we see a box plot. I don't know how much you're familiar with it, but here we have box plots in three cell KPIs, traffic volume, throughput, and uplink average RSSI. You see at the left-hand side traffic volume, when you compare a jammer cell, jammer activated cell with a normal cell, traffic volume and throughput almost around zero. What does it mean? The communication almost stop. And RSSI values already increased 20%. RSSI value is one of the best uh, parameters that you can get on a cell to get opinion about the cell coverage quality, signal quality. So there is a significant impact. And uh, how you deal with jammers today as a mobile operator? <laughs> they are not even known until a customer calls and complains about the coverage, about the performance. This is then, uh, let's say, okay, there is a certain area in Stockholm, people are complaining about the coverage, connectivity, then we send a team, they don't know what they are going to deal with it. They don't know the problem because everything looks okay from my side, on my network, on my components. Everything is green, but let's see what's the problem. That's what they had in their mind when they go to deal with this kind of problems. And it's a t manual process. That's why it's expensive, it takes weeks because they have to analyze lots of data log over the days on five, 15 minutes time resolution to identify what happened, yeah. And uh, most of the time, maybe Jammer is already deactivated, already changed a location. How you can find something like this? How you can find a problem like this in your system? It's like a ghost. Okay, let's do this data-driven approach then. Yeah, it's the one of the best approach right now, hot topic, but still a challenge. You don't have enough data because you are not identified enough number of jammer cases. And uh, you, to be able to do that, you need to go through the data manually. As I said, it's a dynamic system. Sample distribution is changing per location, per cell, per site, per city. KPIs are already varying over the time how you can measure jammer impact on this kind of data sample. And uh, there, are di di there is no one certain pattern, what kind of pattern you are going to look for in your data. It's not one threshold, it's different continuous behavior, right? As I showed you already. So, what we have done is that we defined the jammer detection as anomaly detection problem. It's an anomaly, right? And uh, to be able to, let's say, we do this in an anomaly detection manner, but then we need to have some performance measurements, how we can evaluate our model performance. When it comes to anomaly detection metrics, it's, there are well-known three uh, performance metrics, recall, precision F1 score, a good, a good jammer detection model must capture any or every jammer activation with, uh, low f with minimum false alarms. So we expect from the model, recall and precision should be as high as possible. And uh, F1 score is mean harmonization of these two value. It equally weighs recall and precision. It, it shows you in one single metric. And uh, how it's calculated, I don't know. Do you want to know about it? Or All right, so here, um, the, the labels are red and green labels are showing us what the model responded. So you log data on your system, use it as input. By looking at that samples, data samples, model, model says, yeah, this is a jammer. If it's a really jammer, you label it as red, and if it's a real jammer, it falls on the left side in the blue area. It's called true positive. If model says there is no any jammer, and if in case there is no really jammer activation, then it goes in this purple area as green label, it's called false positive. 
So it, model can make mistake. It can say jammer is activated when it's not. Then the red goes outside of this blue area. If it says there is jammer, there is no jammer. When there is a jammer, it goes outside of this purple area. So there are four cases that you can model like this uh, to evaluate your model performance. So we don't talk about accuracy. Talking about accuracy is something to hide that the model cannot do. <laughs> it's the trick of data scientists. OK, that's why we talk about this matrix. And uh, this is our framework, Jade framework that we developed. Uh, empowered with Python, we have TensorFlow deep learning models that I'm going to present to you. We have scikit-learn, scikit-learn for machine learning part, and we have some data visualization techniques. So in the Jade framework, at the left-hand side, we are getting data from the network in real time, almost real time, every hour. Time resolution is one hour here. And then in the heart of Jade, we have anomal detection models and adaptive thresholding mechanism. These models are multivariate deep LSTM models. One is auto encoder based anomal detection model. The other one is RSSI network KPI prediction based anomal detection model. And these models during the training phase, they trained with a semi-supervised manner. What does it mean? Semi-supervised manner is something uh, that enables us to teach the model what is the normal. So the trained data set is something that we collect where we ensure there is no any Javer activation. Why we do that? Because <coughs> because, as I said, there is no such an environment, uh, so dynamic, and we are in a dynamic environment, everything is changing, right? How you can define normal and abnormal ano anomalies, right? Instead, what we can do is that we teach model what's normal, and then everything deviates from normal is anomaly. That's what we are trying to do. That's why we train the model in semi-supervised manner by showing it what's normal, and it learns, the models only learns what's normal. And uh, let's say a jammer is activated. What happens? Cell KPIs will be affected. There will be high deviation from model's expectation and reality, right? So this is high prediction error in case of RSSI prediction. It's a high reconstruction error in case of autoencoder. So by utilizing adaptive thresholding mechanism, we will say there is a jammer. If it's not too much error, we say there is no any jammer. It's simple. And uh, we use transfer learning. Why? Because, uh, as I said, sample distribution changes when we change a cell, when we change a location. We cannot develop one model for each cell, right? It's uh, it's crazy idea. <laughs> it's impossible to deploy. So by using transfer learning, what we have done is that we took the knowledge from one cell and carried it another cell and accumulated on one big model. It's called frequency agnostic model. So first, we took the cells in one certain uplink frequency. We obtained cell uh, frequency specific model. Then we done this across the cells, across the frequency. Then we got one single model for the whole country, it's called frequency agnostic model. Yes, and in the downstream use case, we also showed another benefit of Jade. We can localize the jammers now when we try to run this. And uh, as, I, as I just presented the KPIs for our models, now we have a data set. Uh, data set mainly in three parts uh, or in two parts, training data and test data. Training data, we have one million samples across the uplink frequencies, across the cells, throughout the country. And uh, these samples are collected where we ensured there is no any jammer and the models learned that the normal, right? The normal case. 
To be able to test the model performance when Jammer is activated, uh, we had three uh, pre-identified Jammer cases. We named the call them J16, 17, and 22. Uh, J16, this continuous. J17 and 22, they are continuous jammers affecting different uplink frequencies, targeting different frequencies. And then we deployed this model uh, to test in the wild. There we detected two jammer cases, J23, discontinuous jammer, and J19, it's a military jammer. So this is the data set that we use. But uh, before we evaluate our performance results of the models, that these sophisticated models and approach, we need to see where we are today. If we use a simple approach, what kind of results we could get? So one straightforward approach is supervised models, right? Uh, then we go for random forest. We see that the limitation of supervised approach. Uh, here at the left-hand side, we have a box plot again. Uh, on three frequencies uh, in the y-axis, we can see in only one frequency, uplink frequency, random forest uh, has a relatively good performance. It's about 0 0.7 F1. And uh, for other uplink frequencies, it requires more data. And uh, we, are, we are already dealing with a problem where we don't have so much data, right? So this is not really applicable, and 0 0.7 is not sufficient. Then there are other baseline approaches, like uh, one approach is random guess. We can give the model, we can feed the model with input samples, and model without looking at the samples can make a random guess. It can say, yes, there is a gem activation randomly, or not. And then we can evaluate this in case of precision recall and a fun score as well. And when we compare this uh, with uh, well-known uh, other primitive anomal detection models, we see random guess is much better than this because we had to use PCA, a kind of uh, dimension reduction technique. And uh, now, let's jump to the JATE. Uh, so random guess was better than the other models, and uh, random forest was not as good as expected. When we look at the, when we train one version of Jade for each uplink frequency, we see in every cases the performance is around 0 0.95. And when we obtained one single model for the whole network by le using transfer learning, it is not less than the others. So it's still performing as good as frequency specific models. So we deployed this model in the network. Tested, uh, uh, we tested this model uh, in different uh, cases, J17 and J22. We got similar good performance. We, and in the field trial, we detected the jammer case, for instance, it looks like this, discontinuous, uh, activating, deactivating, sleeping a little bit, then coming back. So still we have very good performance with this approach. And as I said, in the downstream use case, we can identify the affected cells and label them from blue to orange. So orange are the affected size from a jammer. By just applying single localization, simple localization algorithms, we can identify or estimate the jammer location within a few hundred meters at, in the, at the outdoor environment. So it's quite sufficient, actually. So. This is a published work, and the code is on, on my Medium blog. If you are interested, you can read more details about it, and you can see the implementation. And this work is carried out uh, with uh, universities from UK, Edinburgh and Cambridge, Alan Turing Institute, and Turkcell. So as conclusion, everybody has at least one mobile device and uh, mobile networks, one of the world's most complex system. Jade is the first automated uh, jammer detection framework for mobile networks developed with Python libraries. It's a scalable, uh, scalable solution, and it also helps us to localize the jammers, not, only ident uh, not indicating only jammer activation, but also it gives the localization. So, 
thank you so much and uh, let's get contact. Yes. Uh, yeah, a question over here. We, we are a little bit short on time, so try mm -hmm. to keep the questions brief. Um, one thing that I think is very important and uh, cool is that a lot of IoT, like cars and stuff, also use the networks, and not only people. So it's very important to have these kind of things. Yeah, thank you. So it's more a comment than a question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. Um, so my question is a little bit, is this something that is already deployed and used in networks? And how common uh, is it with, with jammers in, mm. in Sweden today? Yes, um, good question. Uh, well, uh, this is a quite new system, just about to deploy it in one country for one operator. So we don't, I don't have any numbers about Sweden actually. But uh, in, in some scenarios, like in Italy, for instance, when during the praying time, they have a jammer in the church. They turn it on, so people, they don't play with mobile phones and they don't disturb the others. Then sometimes the priest forgets that on. <laughs> it takes weeks. People complain, and then, uh, yeah, this is one of the cases, one of the most common cases. And another mo most common case, if you have uh, security-related issues about president or king or, you know, they're, they're, they are always walking around with jammers. And uh, sometimes, as I said, it affecting some areas, and they don't know why. So watch out your neighbors if you have a ba bad coverage. It might be because they are just very important person <laughs> <laughs> with security guards, yeah. Um, when I did my, my military service, uh, mm -hmm. one of the trainings was actually to locate radio jammers. And uh, mm -hmm. so I've been doing it by, by paling. And uh, ah. it can be quite tricky. And I also yeah. learned that it can be quite dangerous because if you're in a war zone, they usually have a booby trap as well. Yeah, yeah, then they can capture you as well. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Yes, I think we're out of time. Yeah. But uh, I guess you can also talk afterwards. Yes. If there's any more questions. Please come across and uh, have a chat about this interesting topic. <laughs> yeah.